talking about living from the Father's house. We're talking about living in the Father's house, right? We're talking about living in the Father's house. We're going to go to the book of um, John 14. John 14, we're going to talk about living in the Father's house. You know, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 8 that our heart cries out, Abba, Father, right? The Bible says that, you know, the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're the children of God. So because you have the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is letting you know that you're a child of God, right? The Holy Spirit is bearing witness with your spirit that you're a child of God. And the Bible says that our spirit cries out Abba. And Abba has, of course, means father or papa, you know, my source, my everything. So your spirit is crying out Abba, Father. So we're going to talk about the Father's house because there's a lot of believers that are living a lot less than God intended. So my job today is to open your eyes to my job is to open your eyes to, you know, the dimensions you can live. So we're going to go to the book of um, um, John chapter 14, verse 1. It says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whether you go... Whether I go, ye know, and the way ye know. So I says, um, Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? And Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. If ye had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. So when we talk about when we talk about living in the Father's house, when we talk about living in the Father's house, one of the things you got to realize as it relates to living in the Father's house is that you're a child of God. I want everybody to type up, I'm a child of God. I want you to type up, I'm a child of God, right? I want everybody to type up, I'm a child of God. Everybody type up, I'm a child of God. Do that for me. Everybody type up, I'm a child of God. So we're a child of God. That's one thing I want you to really, really get in your I want you to really, really get in your spirit, really, really get in your heart, right? That you are a child of God. Thank you, Ruby. God bless you. You are a child of God. So because you're a child of God, you got to understand that you have a heavenly father, right? You're a child of God. You're the offspring of God. God does not, um, God does not have any orphans, right? God does not leave you. God does not forsake you. God is with you wherever you go. As a matter of fact, you have a promise from the Lord. He said, Lord, I'll be with you always, even unto the end of the age. So even unto the end of the age, Jesus will be with you. To the end of the age, Jesus will be with you. To the end of the age, wherever you go, he's with you, even unto the end of the age. So I want you to be mindful that to the end of the age, Jesus is with you. And also, you're a child of God. So because you are a child of God, you're God's offspring, God is obligated to take care of you, and God is obligated to raise you up, right? And God is obligated to look out for you. God is obligated to nurture you. God is obligated to provide for you. God is obliga obligated to protect you, and God is obligated to um, guide you and answer you, right? So you, I want you to be aware you're a child of God. So just because you're a child of God, you shouldn't live like a mere man or a mere woman, right? The Bible talks about with um, the Bible talks about with with Paul. It talks about people living like mere men or people living like mere women. Right. You're not a mere man. You're not a mere woman. A mere man or a mere woman is a, a someone that has to provide for themselves. Right. Has to take care of themselves, has to protect themselves, has to defend themselves, has to guide themselves. Right. But because you're a child of God, God is responsible for guiding you. God is responsible for leading you. God is responsible for protecting you. God is responsible for um, providing for you. God's responsible for, you know, speaking to you and nurturing you, causing you to grow. Watch this. So one of the things you got to be aware of, according to John 14, verse 1, it says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. One of the most, one of the crises of this hour is everything you see is designed to trouble your heart. Now, the Bible tells us that in the last days, men's heart will fail them for fear and the expectation of things that are coming upon the earth. So you got to be aware in these last days that you don't let your heart be troubled. You heard, we heard it said before that you can have trouble, but don't let trouble get inside you, right? God didn't say you wouldn't have trouble, but he said don't let the trouble get in your heart. So it's, it's your job to keep trouble outside of your heart. The Bible says, guard your heart with all diligence for out of it flows the issues of life. So you have the troubles of this life, the troubles of this hour, the 
troubles of this life, the troubles of this hour, all these things that happen. And when you have the troubles of this life and the troubles of this hour, what begins to happen is these things are trying to set up shop in your heart. They're trying to take over your heart. They're trying to take you emotion. They're trying to make you an emotional, an emotional um, prisoner. They're trying to, hey, how you doing, Quest? They're trying to make you an emotional prisoner. They're trying to make you an emotional captive, right? They're trying to bring you into bondage. The situations of life, if you're not careful, they will try to trouble your heart. Hey, how you, we got Sunny Pool on here. They'll, they'll um, try to trouble your heart. They'll throw you off guard, right? You got to be aware. So it's your job to let not your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. You have to believe in God. I mean, you already believe in God. You got to believe in Jesus as well. Now watch this verse 2. It says, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. So we talk about the father's house. A lot of times when you hear this, a lot of believers are thinking about the day they go to heaven. But I want to submit to you that right now, you can learn how to live from the father's house in this moment, right? Right now, you can learn how to live from the father's house. So the purpose of this periscope is to teach you how to live from your father's house. You don't have to wait till you die to go to your father's house. Am I right about it? You don't have to wait till you die to go to your father's house, to live or to draw resources from your father's house. That word, listen to me, go to verse two. It says, in my father's house are many mansions. That word mansions in the, in the Greek means uh, living places, rooms, about, uh, places to live in, dwelling places. So in God's house, there are a lot of dimensions where you can draw resources from. Am I right about it? So I want you to be aware that the old adage is this. Before you had a problem, God already had provision, right? Before you had a problem, God already had provision. So in the Father's house, things are already there prepared for you. And by faith, you can access what you need when you need it. In the Father's house, there's mercy, right? In the Father's house, there's grace. In the Father's house, there's power. In the Father's house, there's provision. Whatever you need is in the Father's house, and Jesus has prepared a place for you. You know, the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 6, it tells us in Matthew chapter 6 that um, it says, the Father knows what things you have needed before you ask. Your Heavenly Father knows what things you have needed before you ask. One of the things I emphasized last night in the School of the Prophets was this, was that, you know, when people are praying in the Spirit, when you're praying in the spirit, I want you to be aware. Anytime you're praying in the spirit, answers are coming to you for the future, right? And I want you to be aware that there are dimensions in God where you can have the answer before you have a problem. You can already have the answer before you have a problem. So the more you pray in tongues, the more answers you'll have. And when the moment comes, you'll just tap into that answer and you'll know what to do. Now, in the same way, God thinks generationally, right? God does not, it, God doesn't think in a way where something happens and he has to make something shake or make something move or do something. God is already prepared. The Bible says that the lamb, the lamb was slain before the foundation of the earth. Before humans existed, God had already slammed, already slain the lamb, which means that God already took into consideration their ability to fall. Am I right about it? So God had already had provision made in case they missed it and in case they fell, which he knew they would. So God had provision set aside. I want you to be aware that in the Father's house, there are many mansions. There are many dwelling places. There are many aboding places. There are many dimensions from which you can draw from. As a matter of fact, the Bible calls God's, one of God's names is El Shaddai. Everybody can speak in tongues. Absolutely. Um, one of God's names is El Shaddai, El Shaddai, and El Shaddai means the most high breasted one. El Shaddai means the most high breasted one. God has many breasts, right? And we talk about breasts. We're talking about from the standpoint of a newborn babe that's drawing from their mother's, a newborn babe that's drawing from their mother's breast. See, a, a baby relies on the mother's milk. Am I right about it? And this baby, uh, when it's hungry, it begins to nurse from this breast. And God has many breasts, which means that God can feed many people at one time in many different needs or situations you have. You can draw from the breast of God because he's El Shaddai. He's the multi-breasted one. He's the all-powerful one. He's the all-sufficient one. What does that mean? When you talk about God being the all-sufficient one, God is the only self-existent being, which means God is the only one that needs nobody else but itself to survive or to thrive. Am I right about it? God needs nobody else but itself. He's self-existent. He's self-sufficient. The only self, the only necessary being. Am I right about it? God is the only thing that's necessary. That doesn't need anything else to be necessary. It doesn't need anything else to have power. Am I right about it? So we have to learn as believers how to live from the Father's house. We have to learn how to approach God in times of need. We have to learn how to draw from God in times of need. We have to realize that just because things in the natural may not be where you want them to be, 
does not mean that God can't meet your needs. You know, like one of my favorite examples, there's a lot of times in my life up to thus far where my bank, my bank account wouldn't show the provision of God, right? But it, I, it's like I get miracles all the time. Like literally, it seems like as soon as I need something, money just comes, right? Money just comes. Money, money always comes when I need it. Am I right about it? Money always comes when I need it. But the reason money always comes is because I learned how to grab hold of the breast of Jehovah Jireh, the breast of Jehovah Jireh. I've learned how to draw from that breast, right? Draw from that breast of Jehovah Jireh. And when I need provision, I suck on that breast and I begin to draw my provision from God. Am I right about it? Just how there are times where you feel lonely. Am I right about it? And you have to learn how to go to that breast of Jehovah Shammah, that he's ever present. God is, is God is ever present. He's present with you and begin to draw from that place, place and begin to tap into the presence of God. There are times where you need healing and you have to go to that breast called Jehovah Rapha. He's the Lord God that heals thee and you begin to suck on that breast and he begins to give you what you need. Am I right about it? So God nurses us. Am I right about it? And, and when you go to the father's house, when you're living out of the father's house, you're learning how to not be troubled because every trouble of life, God already has provision. The mo Listen to me. They say that peace is the emotion of faith. One more time. They say that peace is the emotion of faith. One of the signs you're in faith is peace. When you're in faith, when you're in faith, you feel peace. Because peace knows that God has already worked it out. Peace knows God has already made a way. So peace is not moved by what it sees. There's a lot of believers that have no peace, right? They're, 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 circumstantial, they're circumstantial believers. You got to be aware. Listen to me. You can't, you can't have, we call it the, those two perspectives, right? We call it the occupational perspective and the situational perspective. If you're going to be prophetic, you have to learn those things. We have what's called the occupational perspective. And the situational perspective, a situational perspective is a perspective where you allow your situation to dictate your disposition. A situational perspective is a perspective where you allow your situation to dictate your disposition. If your listen to me, your situation should not dictate your disposition. Your God should God, the God you serve should dictate your disposition. When you really believe God, you're not going to allow your circumstances to dictate how you feel. If you were to lose it all, be like Job. The Bible says that Job's first response was to shave his head and bow down and worship God. How many of you can lose everything in a day and your first response be to, be to worship? Most of, most of our first response, I remember, I remember one time I was witnessing to an a, a, um, atheist. He was talking about how somebody lied to him and they told him that um, the reason his mom had al Alzheimer's because um, God was visiting the sins of the third, fourth generation. So he lost his faith. And now I was at a job at the hospital and I was talking to him and I was ministering to him about the Lord or whatever. And I, I remember uh, he was trying to disprove God. And I had never heard anybody say this. He was like, he said, tell me this. He said, he said, you tell me. He said, he said, why did God let that? He said, why did God let that stuff happen to Job? <laughs> he said, he said, if I was Job, I would have committed suicide right up the spot. <laughs> And look, that's how a lot of people that don't know God, that's their response. When things go away, when things go south, when things don't go the way that they expect them to go, right? They want to commit suicide. Why? Because they're without God. They're without hope in the world. They're without God. They're without hope in this world. But we have hope in this world because we have God. Am I right about it? We have hope in this world because we have God. I said we have hope in this world because we have God. So you got to be mindful. We have hope in this world because we have God. So you're never hopeless because God is your hope. Jesus is your hope. And hope in God does not disappoint. What is hope? Hope is a confident expectation that things will turn out for your good. If, you're not, if you don't expect things to work out for your good, you're hopeless. Hopeless people expect bad things. So that's why the Bible tells us to put on the helmet of hope. And I want to talk about that. It's a, 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 one of the things God's going to talk about, about hope. Because when you put on the thing of hope, what begins to happen is hope will guard your mind from thinking bad outcomes. The Bible says you got to put on the, the helmet of hope. Hope is designed to keep your mind from breakdowns, right? It's, it's to keep your mind from having a mental breakdown. Hope does that. So I want you to be aware that Jesus has gone before you. And Jesus has prepared a place for you. Every problem you're in right now in the Father's house is provision. And I'm not just talking about financial provision. I'm talking about emotional provision, emotional provision. I'm talking about I'm talking about uh, relational provision. I'm talking about 
health provision. I'm right about it. I'm talking about um, I'm talking about creative provision where you need ideas. You need ideas to make more money. God has it. You need ideas for your business. God has it, right? You need ideas for your business. God has it. You, you need uh, you, you need to know who to connect with. God has it. Am I right about it? Whatever problem you're in, Jesus has gone before you. And Jesus has prepared a place for you already. So you have to learn how to draw from this provision, how to be dropping this provision. Number one, we got to be prayerful. By faith, you approach God. The Bible says that draw nigh to God, he'll draw near to you. A lot of us, we don't know how to draw near to God. What do I mean by that? We don't have the faith to draw near to God. You know, when stuff get bad, we run away from God rather than draw near. Your first response to difficulty, your, your first response to adversity, your, your first response to hardship and crisis should be to draw near to God. By faith, you draw near to God. By faith, you go before God in faith, believing that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Anytime you diligently seek God, you'll never go unrewarded. No matter how long it seems like it's taking, if you're seeking God, he'll always reward you. Always. So you got to be aware that the first way to draw from this provision, you have to draw near to God by faith. By faith, you got to approach God. You approach God in confidence based on his word. That's why it's so important that you know the word of God, because the word of God gives you confidence to approach God. The more you know the word, the, the more... Uh, the more fervent and the more bold you'll be in a place of prayer. A lot of us pray like widows and not like brides, right? A widow prays, you know, like, like her husband has died and she's just hopeless. But a bride knows that her husband is going to give her whatever she asks. Amen. So you have to pray based on God's word because God has fulfilled. He's obligated himself to fulfill his word. See, um, I, one thing I can, I can say with, with, with full confidence, maybe since I've been about 19 years old, I can even say about 18, it's, it's, I believe it to be John chapter 9. Jesus said this. He said, Father, he said, I always, he said, I know you always hear me when I pray, but I say this for them. There's a place in God where you can know God always hears you when you pray. I can say beyond a shadow of a doubt, ever since I've been about 19 years old when I learned how to pray, I know it, God always hears me when I pray. I never doubt if God hears me. Why? Because I only talk to God based on his word. I only talk to God based on his word. Only. I only talk to God based on his word. That's it. Because I know this is the confidence I have in him. That if I ask anything according to his will, he hears me. And if I know he hears me, then I know he'll grant the petitions he's asked. So the, the key to prayer is to ask according to God's will. The key to prayer is to ask according to God's will. Anytime you ask according to God's will, he hears you. You got to learn to ask according to God's will. God's will is in his word. The old adage is this, faith begins where the will of God is known. You can never have faith until you know God's will. God's will is revealed in his word. Faith begins where the will of God is known. Anytime you don't know God's will, you can't have faith. But I can exercise faith when I know what God wants. So when I realize, according to John 14, 2, that God has many places I can live from. When I realize in John 14, 2, that God has many places I can draw from. When I realize in John you know, 14, 2, that he has prepared a place for me, that he, he, the Bible says that there's a way of escape. There's a way of escaping temptation. And then also, before I, when I'm in prayer, can you imagine? The Bible says before a word is on your tongue, he knows it all together. You know, the Bible says before a thought is in your mind, he already knows. Before you even think a thought, God knows you're going to think. That's how detailed God is in making ways. That's how detailed God is in making provision. That's how detailed God is in, in providing for you. That's how intimate and acquainted God is with you. Am I right about it? He's acquainted with all your ways. Be mindful. So can you imagine that every time you pray, God already knows what you have needed before you ask every single time? That he already knows, but he wants you to humble yourself and rely on him because God just wants glory. Do you not know for God is all about glory? God just wants glory. He wants a man or a woman to believe him and trust him so he can get glory. That's all God wants. God wants a man or woman to trust and believe him so he can get glory. That's it. God just wants the glory. He wants to be believed. They say God's greatest um, pleasure is to be believed. God's greatest pain is to be doubted. Am I right about it? God, it, it crushes God's heart when we don't believe he's able to do things, but he wants someone that'll believe him. Am I right about it? So you have to learn how to believe God in the midst of what you see. You have to learn how to believe God in the midst of what you're going through, because everything you're up against is for the glory of God. God wants glory. So your situation seems, it doesn't seem so glorious, 
But if you trust God and believe God, God will move by his spirit so he can get the glory because God wants the praise. So if you believe in God, God will never fail to honor his word. God will never fail to honor his word. God will never fail to be true to who he is. So I want you to be mindful that right now you're living in the father's house right now. You're living in the father's house. And by faith, I want you to begin to learn how to draw from God's resources. Draw from the multi-breasted one. He's El Shaddai, the multi-breasted one. There's so many different breasts you can feed from. Whatever you have need of, he already knows. God is able to make all grace abound towards you and all sufficiency. You won't lack in any good thing, but you'll abound in every good work. God is able and willing. God is able and willing. God is able to make all grace abound. Whatever grace you need, whatever you need help in, etc. God has, he's, he's able to make all grace abound towards you. And all sufficiency, just enough grace, and all sufficiency, so you won't lack in any good thing. God has so much grace, you won't lack in any good thing in any area, and you will be able to abound in every good work. Any good thing you need to do in the name of God, he will make sure you're able to do because of his grace. So I want you to be mindful of this, and it's really going to shift your life. So look, I'm going to stop, but I'm coming right back on here. We're going to stop right here. Uh, listen, if you don't subscribe to my YouTube channel... Subscribe to my YouTube channel, Darnell Craig. Go on my YouTube channel, subscribe to Darnell Craig. If you don't follow me on Periscope, follow me on Periscope, Darnell Craig. If you don't follow me on Twitter, follow me on Twitter at underscore all caps, T-O-A-U-M. Underscore all caps, T-O-A-U-M. Like I said, I'm believing God for 10 new partners this month. If, if you feel called to God to be a partner, you want to support me and partner partnering, you want to help, you want to pledge to give a certain amount each month to help further the work of the ministry, to help support some of the things I'm trying to do as it relates to book writing, recording, a lot of different things I want to do. You know, if you want to help support that, go to darnellcraig.com, become a partner, go to the homepage at the bottom, go to the, become a partner, and you can pledge to give a certain amount each month to help further the cause of the ministry. Last but not least, those who want to enter into the School of the Prophets, make sure you enroll in the School of the Prophets, E O G. I do one video a week every Monday. Um, it's $80 a month, four videos a month. Enroll in the School of the Prophets. I'm teaching you guys how, right in this month, how to live a prophetic lifestyle. I pray it blesses you, I pray it helps you. I'm coming right back on, so be on the lookout. Okay, bye-bye.